Uh, let's jump right in. Uh, time. Time is a social construct. This talk does not have a simple ending, does not have many, if any, solutions because time is difficult. Time is truly a social construct. And as we know, social constructs are garbage, so using the transitive property of math, we can conclude that time is garbage. <laughs> we want to believe it is simple because simple is easy, but that simplicity doesn't hold up to any scrutiny. I'm your host for the evening, Daniel Cousineau. You can find me on Twitter at dcousineau. Uh, pronouns are he, him. So a long time ago, I peaked. Uh, you can see me peeking right here. Uh, this isn't a humble brag so much as it is a sign of the times. My most popular tweet of all time was a joke about how painful time is. My second most uh, uh, popular tweet was also about how painful time is. And I got a lot of replies, some of which I reserved. <laughs> others seized upon fruitier interpretations. However, others sadly were laboring under the delusion that there was an easy answer. Even those answers we've accepted as easy truths are not as complete or as exhaustive as we would want. And I'm not the only one who had these problems. Everybody has these problems with time. So let's start with a simple problem to solve. Let's say I had a button on my phone that if I tapped it, it would dispense food for my cats at home. Uh, I haven't automated it yet because that's a talk for the NodeBots people. Francis is, I'm sure, out there somewhere. He can start writing that one. But I want to feed my cats at noon every day. Otherwise, they'll get angry and start destroying all of my things. So let's get started. Uh, my physics teacher back in high school taught me when you're solving a problem, start by writing down what you know. Well, we're going to start simply and say, I know that at tomorrow, on August 15th, uh, I want to feed my cats at 12 p.m. Now, most wouldn't ask questions beyond this. Um, they wouldn't ask any questions beyond this. They would just uh, 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 start digging into their project. But we want to dig in a little bit deeper, and we want to ask ourselves some deeper questions. What is 12 p.m.? To a computer system, it's a, maybe a point on a timeline, an arbitrary number in the scheme of things. But to a human, this time has context. I contend that 12 PM actually means nothing to you. But sometime around lunch does. Halfway through my day does. When the sun is right overhead, these are things that have meaning to us that we just happen to attach to the number 12. Time for us humans and cats is relative and entirely according to our perspective. But there's a problem. Whose 12 PM is this? That specific question is something that is fairly recent in human history, us asking that question. All right, there we go. Since the dawn of time, or at least a really, really long time ago, we followed a circadian rhythm. We wake when the sun rises, we eat it at its zenith, and we fall asleep when it sets. Uh, our crops were planted and harvested, our dinners served, appointments made, all along this rhythm. Even the advent of the mechanical clock did very little to change this, merely giving a mechanical consistency and precision to our solar day. And during the Industrial Revolution, this efficiency was very key, as we'll allude to later. Despite having these clocks, we still needed our older, more traditional sundials. You see, we still align our clocks to ensure that 12 PM aligned with solar noon. To do so required taking advantage of the development of the equation of time which is a formula that took into account for variances in the Earth's orbit and tilt to identify when a solar minute would be longer or shorter than a theoretically perfect orbit with no tilt or variances, which our mechanical clocks were significantly better at providing, or only capable of providing, really, if you think about it. A clock set, uh, uh, clocks that we set were set such that over the course of the year, the difference between these readings, where it was longer or shorter, would eventually average out and manage out to zero. And we began to know this as mean solar time. And when a local village would set their clocks to this time such that it would eventually catch back up with itself, we called this the local mean time. Cities began adopting public clocks because they were big and expensive things. We couldn't really all have pocket watches. Uh, and these clocks would help cement and make accessible this local mean time for the surrounding community. Uh, everybody could set their days based off of the clock um, in the center of town. As cities grew, different areas had needs of clocks. Courthouses would have a clock. Bureaucratic buildings would have a clock. But all these clocks would need to be set to the same time. However, not all of them would actually be set to the same time. For example, courthouses and other government buildings would often be set 10 minutes slow to give citizens leeway for their appointments. Is your appointment at 12 and you get caught up in a three-cart horse accident with cabbages all over the ground and you actually show up at 12.05? Don't worry. As far as the court concerned, it's actually 11.55 in the morning. But our perspective widened in an explosive way. 
In the early 1800s, humankind went through a radical transformation of technology. Electric lights meant the, the workday no longer ended with the sun setting. Um, uh, the telegraph meant that we could communicate over long distances in the blink of an eye. And the advent of trains meant that traveling that previously took days now took mere hours. Pop quiz. In 1830, a train leaves Paris at 12.51 p.m., traveling at 100 kilometers per hour for roughly 1,000 kilometers to Berlin. What time does it arrive? If you said 10.51 p.m., you are incorrect. The real answer is, hell if I know, or more, more accurately, from whose perspective? Is it the time in Paris or the time in Berlin that you care about? What is the difference between the two? How do I know which clock is faster or slower? You see, the sun reaches high noon four minutes later for every degree of longitude traveled towards the west. That means each town usually had different local mean times that were several minutes off and apart. Stagecoach companies would keep these large compendiums of local mean time differences of all the locations that they served so that travelers could adjust their watches as they arrived on their destination. Uh, however, with stagecoaches being so slow, this really wasn't a problem. You were usually only per day going to one location. However, with the advent of trains, things were more complicated. To simplify and solve these problems that the railways were having, the railways internally came up with their own concept of railway time. All across Europe and America, they would adopt their own time that they operated off of. Um, for the most part, it was either a single or maybe just a finite set of time areas that these trains would operate in. However, railway time often had nothing to do with the local mean town of the train station that it was located in meaning you would have to set your watch when you got on the train, set your watch again while you got off, once more once you left the train station and entered the town, and probably a fourth time once you entered the courthouse for your appointment. This particular picture right here is the exchange in Bristol showing two minute hands, as you can see. One showing the local time and one showing London time because trains made Bristol accessible enough that it was possible that somebody was coming quickly from London or you were doing business with London, especially using uh, a telegraph machine. This complexity came to a head on August 12th in 1853. Two Providence and Wooster trains, by the way, I'm really proud that I can pronounce Wooster, uh, collided uh, head on, killing 13 and injuring 50 in one of the largest train accidents of its day. It's also famous for being one of the first photographed train wrecks in history. After an investigation, it was determined that an inability to calculate arrival and departure times caused the trains to think that they would miss each other, when in fact, as you can see, they did not. While it wasn't the direct catalyst, it lent credence to a growing movement to standardize time around a singular mean time with increasing divisions radiating outward across the world. But even this was fraught with politics and not science. England wanted their royal observatory to be the meridian. France felt it was the seat of scientific power and that Paris should be the center of all time. And the Germanic Empire felt Prussian standard time should be the tent pole around which all of our clocks operated. However, since about two thirds of all nautical charts used Greenwich Mean Time um, in England, it obviously won out as being the prime meridian for this new standardization of time. Now, calculating Paris to Berlin was simple, and train accidents, at least for the cause of misscheduling, reduced significantly. So this same question applies to our previous example of me pressing a button and feeding my cats. From whose perspective is noon? You see, if we're going based off of me, I said, I know at noon I need to press a button and feed my cats. If I were to do it tomorrow here in San Diego, my cats would actually get their food at 3 p.m. Not the worst thing in the world. They might get a little bit peeved. Maybe one of the flower pots gets knocked off of a counter. <laughs> However, when we're in Italy next month on vacation, if I pressed it at noon at Italy time, that food's coming out at 6 a.m. and I'm probably not coming home to a functional apartment. And I very proud of my apartment. So we realize there's more to our date than a simple number or even a simple position of the sun. It is insufficient to know when. We must also know where the 12 p.m. is. So we're going to sit here and say, OK, I know that I'm four hours off of UTC in New York City. Great. I feel really smart. It's time to get coding on the project. First up, we need to store this information in a computer readable format. We could use Unix timestamps, but it's not very readable, it's not very understandable, and it's often fraught with significant issues. 
for example, uh, like I said, I used to work with, or like Katie said, I used to work with PHP. Back in the day, there were some bugs where PHP would uh, use the system's local clock instead of UTC to generate Unix timestamps. So I kind of grew up distrusting Unix timestamps. In 1988, several ISO time formats were superseded by ISO 8601. From this standard, we received a universal method indicating a timestamp, which is a point in time that could easily be digested by both machines and humans, as well as converted in and out of universal time without necessarily knowing the context of the systems you're sending this information to. This is why ISO 8601 was so powerful and originally used in email. That was the original intended purpose of ISO 8601. The key defining feature is the ability to attach a UTC offset with the timestamp. So this way, I can send a message to a server and say, yeah, I generated this at this time at minus 0400. You can do with this as you please, and you can figure it out based off of what you're doing, um, and I don't have to worry about where and when you are. So great. So for example, tomorrow's feeding in ISO 8601 would look a heck of a lot like this. In fact, it would look exactly like this. Noon at 0400, uh, with minus 0400 um, on the 15th. Correct, yes, for now. Remember, I said earlier that time zones are a political beast. When they were adopted, scientists originally invented these, envisioned these clean one-hour time zones running along longitude lines, starting from a central point that we now know is the Greenwich Mean Time over the Greenwich Observatory. But time zones didn't come out so clean. They didn't follow natural longitudinal boundaries. No, that would have been far too easy. In the US, our time zones are ragged, you can see, but they're, for the most part, clean. It's fairly reasonable. But things don't stay simple. As you start exploring this map of time zones, you start seeing time zones starting to migrate east and west when they really shouldn't. You see Argentina down here. Uh, they probably really should be in minus four, but you know, Argentina just does whatever Argentina wants, and so we just deal with it as best we can. But God knows what the hell is happening here. We got five and a half, uh, we got three and a half, five, four and a half, six and a half, uh, uh, time zone offsets, no idea what's happening. It continues to get worse. I'm not even sure I can follow the plot anymore with uh, how these lines are going around. And then things just get extra special in Australia that we'll cover a little bit later. <laughs> Gotta love the Australians. All right, I accidentally forgot to remove that slide. And then Antarctica is the worst. Look at this. Look at this and just cry. That's what I did. Uh, but honestly, if you look at this, as much as I like to complain about how ridiculous this is, it makes sense. Uh, remember, uh, time zones exist to ensure that we have standard time, and we still orient our clocks around solar noon. When you're at the south pole of this planet, there really isn't much of a concept of a solar, solar noon lasts months. So there really is no concept of which time zone I'm in. And as you start moving away, all of a sudden, a zenith of the sun becomes reasonable. So it just becomes the time zone of whatever country happens to have uh, a research base uh, on the continent. OK, so I'm what, you know, I don't even know, 15, 16 minutes into this talk, and we haven't really even started yet. So you know what? I just don't want to deal with any of this, and I'm just going to store this as UTC in my database, just like all of those geniuses replying to my Twitter thread uh, said I should do. So now I go, hey, great, you know, at 1600 Z, I need to, uh, Z being the shorthand for UTC, that I need to feed my cats. And so whenever I'm in Italy, I can go, hey, great, I know how to convert from UTC to Italy time. Great, that's when I need to press the button. Done. On to the next step. Good Lord. But wait. If you remember, the reason we have time zones rather than a single time is because we associate uh, uh, time with concepts like sun and sky, very hot. Um, if we were to sit here and say like, oh yeah, 12 p.m. is lunch for me, but 12 p.m. for somebody else is bedtime, that's just really confusing. We can't deal with that. And during the summer months in areas outside of equatorial regions, solar hours are much longer than normal. Or to put it more simply, you get more daylight hours. Our newly rigid and industrialized society needed to be simplified and replicated at scale. Uh, industrialists really loved making money, and the easiest way to do it is if everybody showed up at exactly the same time and left at exactly the same time. Your day started and ended at the exact same mean time, and if that meant half the year you woke up in pitch black darkness and the other half of the year you went home in pitch black darkness, so be it, the wealthy industrialist doesn't particularly care. But this man, this man did care. 
New Zealander George Vernon Hudson didn't like this and wouldn't stand for it. You see, he really liked to go out and collect insects after work. And this whole the universe is messy and complicated thing really wasn't his jam. So he was one of the first to put forward the modern proposal that eventually became daylight savings time where in which we changed our clocks such that if I always left work at 5 p.m., I can guarantee no matter what time of year it is, 5 p.m. would always be when the sun is up and he could go off and catch butterflies. Yes, all of our problems that we've ever had with daylight savings time was caused by a dude who just wanted to go play with bugs after work. <laughs> Modern daylight savings time in the U.S. is defined as moving the local UTC offset forward one hour at 2 a.m. on the second Sunday of March and reverting to the original standard time at 2 a.m. on the first Sunday of November. Uh, so the idea is uh, at a certain time of year we're minus 0400 and then in New York City we're minus 0500. But wait, Daniel, where are you going with this? If you're noticing, there's a flaw in our simple UTC solution you did. I was assuming that 1600 UTC is always going to be 12 p.m. New York City time. However, that's not the case all year round. During standard time, which is the uh, uh, fall and winter months, uh, UTC is, uh, 1600 UTC is actually 11 a.m. local time. So my cats would be fed early. They're not exactly angry about that, but I, as a programmer, everything needs to be perfect and it bothers me. You see, it's the offset that changes for New York. If the location I'm in at the time doesn't change their offset, I don't know this, and if I operate on local time, I completely lose this context in New York City. You see, UTC does not follow daylight savings time. It stays the same throughout year round. That's why we think it's a simple solution and we like using it, but we forget a certain amount of context. But like time zones, daylight savings time was also politically uh, implemented and based, uh, politically implemented and based, and thus arbitrary, inconsistent, and very capricious. Here we have the United States. Notice our friend Arizona, nominally mountain time, but not observing daylight savings time according to this very helpful and handy legend. Except if we start zooming in and we read this closely, we see this little line right here. Yes, Arizona doesn't follow DST, except unless you're on the Navajo Indian Nation in Arizona, in which case you do follow daylight savings time. So to sum it up, in the US, while somebody in Chicago and somebody in Dallas will always have their clocks set to the same time year round, somebody in Salt Lake City and somebody in Phoenix will have different clocks depending upon the time of year, unless you're on the Navajo Nation, in which case you're not different, or are, or whatever, I don't care anymore, it's getting confusing. Unless you think I'm picking just on the United States, we're not the only one with this problem. Here we have Australia doing these little you know, half minute time zones and partially daylight savings time applicability where you have no idea what your neighbor's clock is at any given time unless you have a reference book and I don't have enough space on my shelf. I live in New York City. Fun fact, um, what's wrong with this time? I'm gonna let you look at it for a little bit. I'm even gonna give you a little hint. I'm gonna start making you focus on the parts of it that are actually important. The answer is, is for those of you, some of you may have gotten this in your head, some of you may not, the answer is, is this time does not exist unless you live in Arizona, not on the Navajo Indian Nation. <laughs> Notice how it's 2.01 in the morning on the 10th of March in 2019 uh, at minus 0700 hours. At that point in time, Salt Lake City at 2 a.m., Salt Lake City would have flipped over to 3 a.m. There is no 2.01 a.m. in Salt Lake City, but there is in Arizona. But Arizona is not the only odd man out. Some state had to come out and make things a little bit more ridiculous. Which state is that? If you thought Florida, then you were correct. <laughs> in 2018, Florida no longer wants to change time. And unlike Arizona, they always want to be on daylight savings time, as opposed to Arizona, which is never on daylight savings time. I have some feelings about Florida. <laughs> However, regardless of those feelings, I really want to take you through this bill because it's fantastic. Look at the wording of this bill. Whereas, as the Sunshine State, Florida should be kept sunny year-round. I have feelings about the wording of this bill. But for those of you who wonder why didn't I have a panic about this a year ago, if we read the fine pen, it turns out Florida passed this bill without the ability to actually implement it. You see, the federal code says you are allowed to opt out as a state. You are allowed to opt out of DST. You are not allowed to permanently opt into DST. So this bill was kind of put in place saying, well, maybe if one day, if the federal government lets us, we'll be completely ridiculous. So I actually have no idea what's happening in Florida. But we need something more than these UTC offsets, because as we're seeing, like, there's so much context loss. Enter the IANA uh, time zone identifier. Um, 
This was started around 1986 and effectively invented the naming conventions of America slash New York and these times when identifiers that we know as programmers but maybe haven't actually delved into. Uh, and it's very critically important to being able to calculate accurate historical as well as future, uh, future historical timestamps. Uh, I highly suggest if you hadn't, you haven't, you go to the ina.org website, you go download the data, database, and open up the news file. The change log for the database is absolutely fantastic. Like, look at this. The Egyptian government changed its mind on short notice, and Africa Cairo will not introduce DSD after all. It's absolutely fascinating. It's like a study of a descent into madness, of like one lone sysadmin trying to bring order to the world. When I first gave this talk a while ago, this change log was at the very top of the file. For those of you with good eyes, you'll notice it is now line 1327. So there's a lot that's been happening since 2016. So we ditch offsets, and instead we mark the uh, closest municipality that we uh, follow their standards on. Um, is your timestamp America Phoenix or America Denver? It's very important. If you're Denver, you're respecting DST and calculations, and the computer will know this. But if you're in Phoenix, it knows not to respect uh, a daylight savings time. It's very important for historicity as well as knowing information on the locale. However, if you dig into the file, there's even more fun. If you thought Florida was crazy, have I got a story for you. <laughs> Reading this document, we see Indiana gets its own namespace, and it shows up several times. I had no idea why this was, so I thought to myself, maybe Wikipedia can help. So I loaded up the page, and this is the Time in Indiana Wikipedia page. <laughs> uh, some of you may be thinking, what's ridiculous about that? Well, this is the Time in Texas Wikipedia page. <laughs> and this is the Time in New York page, where it's literally just a couple signs about how New York decides when broadcast times are. So let's actually take a deep dive into Indiana. So from 1918, so around 1918, the Standard Time Act made Indiana central time zone. Some counties decided to ignore this and observe Eastern time instead, some daylight savings time. So we off to a good start, doing whatever they want even though they're supposed to be central time. Around 1961, the Interstate Commerce Commission divided Indiana in half between Eastern time and central time. Absolutely nobody in Indiana observed this. Counties in the north, in 1967, counties in the northwest near Chicago and in the southwest observed daylight savings time in the central time zone. Everybody else was in eastern time with only six of those counties observing daylight savings time. Are you following me? 1977, Pike County moved from central to eastern time and stopped observing daylight savings time. In 1991, Stark County in the northwest moved from eastern time and decided to not observe daylight savings time. In 2006, eight total counties moved from Eastern to Central time, and the entire state decided to observe daylight savings time. In March of 2007, Pulaski County in the Northwest returned to Eastern time, and in November of 2007, uh, five Southwestern counties returned to Eastern time. And then my favorite part, there are counties in Indiana that don't even do any Indiana time zones. Dearborn and Ohio County follow New York time, uh, Chicago is a bunch of them, and then America, Kentucky, Louisville, which that's another fun one. Kentucky gets its own namespace. Absolutely fantastic. So, rolling this together, we now realize we need more contextual information than just an offset. The offset is insufficient, and the where this time stamp is happening, where this time is happening is so critical to the function that it can't be left out. Because really, my cats just like your users, could care less what the Indiana legislature, the New York legislature, the whatever legislatures decided to do when and where and what. All they care about is, are they going to get their snack at noon? That's the only thing they care about, and it's the only thing your users care about. So let's continue on and actually implement everything we learned, and unfortunately, time's about up. <laughs> so did we learn anything? I think maybe we did, probably not. I have a couple of takeaways from this talk that I hope you kind of walk away with. One is we should treat time as if it's irreducibly complex. Remember, everything about it is political, and we cannot drive this down into incredibly simple solutions because it's arbitrary and made up in the first place. It's complex because we decided to make it complex, and we should probably respect that it's always going to be complex. Time is a question of where almost as much as it is when. While it is perfectly reasonable to capture, say, your logs on your server as a 
pinpoint in a universal time, that's perfectly fine. For what you present to your users and what your users present to you, where the user is, where their perspective is, and where they think the action that they're taking is happening is vitally important, and we should be aware of that when we build our systems. You should treat UTC like it's merely a synchronization and conversion aid. Converting all of your timestamps to UTC will not save you, and you should not treat it as if it will save you. Treat UTC as neutral ground, the place where you can meet to exchange information. Always preserve your presented offsets and time zones and only convert to UTC when you have to. For those of us that are still using MySQL, you have no ability to store any sort of UTC offset with your timestamps, so you convert it to UTC so you can do calculations. If you're using Postgres, take advantage of that power you have to you. But more importantly, if a user gives you a timestamp in minus 0400, preserve that minus 0400. You don't know when you'll need it later, and it's not going to hurt your calculations now. Always use ISO 8601 in transit and let the browser handle the rest. Treat timestamps like you would treat anything with accessibility. Give the browser and the user control. Don't try to take over and tell them what's best. Let them and their tools decide what's best. Let their browser decide what time they want to see things in. Be explicit about the context with your user. If this talk was confusing for you, and it certainly was for me, it's worse for them. Tell them exactly when they're creating a timestamp. Say, hey, by the way, when you set this to 12 p.m., it's 12 p.m. in Eastern time. It's 12 p.m. in San Francisco time. Tell them exactly when and what they're doing is, because chances are they're not thinking about it. They're only thinking about their local time, and you will catch bugs early if you at least take those extra few pixels to warn them about what's happening. And use a library, especially for simple uh, arithmetic. I personally have fallen in love with date FNS, there's Moment.js, there's Luxon, there's proposals uh, for uh, 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 temp temporal stuff in Node. Use a library. Don't try to roll your own, even if it's simple as adding 3,600 seconds to a time. Just use the library and wrap the functionality. If the library is wrong, the library will fix it. Time is more complicated than we give it any sort of credit for. And when all else fails, just move to Florida. It's the sunshine state, and it's going to be sunny year-round. And if you thought I would talk about my cats this whole time without a picture, here you go. These are our cute boys. Thank you very much.